Okay, everyone. Um, my name is Andy. This is the Coffee with a Geek show. I do want to. Uh, I don't have coffee today, but I do have this little graphite mug. And if you've never seen graphite.org, that's a really awesome site uh, for reviewing apps and games and stuff, especially for teachers and the parents. So uh, check that out. You can also get a certification through uh, the graphite website. And uh, you can get a water bottle like that. So check it out. Uh, with me today is a, is, a, is a guest that's really close to me, uh, physically, geographically, I should say, and right down the street from me in Dunkirk. And I've heard uh, I've heard more about you, Mark, than I've actually had a chance to talk with you about. So it's a great opportunity for me uh, to chat. And with me is Mark Drollinger. He's a middle school science teacher from Dunkirk. And uh, again, I came across Mark because I, I heard a lot of buzz about your presentations from, um, I think you were at NiceGate and at uh, the Digital Wave conference. Yeah. And, uh, and, and seriously, to, to get kind of a buzz off of those conferences with so much going on and to hear you know, your name come up, I was really, it's always impressive to just see that. Oh, thanks. Um, and then when I started doing research even for the show and I checked out your YouTube videos, I was really impressed and I do want to talk. Uh, more about that, but um, so let's start with that question. Uh, sure. The YouTube videos, I thought they're really effective. I thought they're really powerful, and they're really the, the production value. I think is really good. So, can you talk about maybe how you got started and what programs you use, and yeah, and go from there. Well, thanks. Thanks for having me on the show. I'm honored to be here. This is something new for me. It's an, it's kind of exciting. So, thanks again for having me. But um, yeah, the YouTube videos were they started out of. Um, a classroom observation. I was for, for before I was tenured. Um, you know, you have to get observed so many times by a principal, and he gave me my uh, notice. He said I need to observe you, and I was like, okay. So I went home and I was starting to think about what I wanted to do, and I know I I knew I wanted to make something um, memorable for the observation because it was my last one before tenure, and then something out of the box and unique. So I went home and I said. Um, I'm not going to talk at all in this lesson. I'm going to have the kids do everything on their own um, the whole 40 minutes. So I said, all right, how am I going to make that happen? So I decided to make um, four short um, content videos about science. And I signed out through BOCES. At the time, the, there weren't iPads. There were um, the iPod Touches, one of the first generations. So I signed out those, and I loaded all the videos onto to there. And the principal came in for the observation, and uh, I gave the kids about two minutes of prep and, and said, all right, this is what you're going to be doing today. I have this activity, which was on a worksheet form that goes along with some content, and you're going to get it through the iPod Touches in the form of video. And um, they loved it. It was the first time the kids had, now we would call it a flipped lesson, um, but it's the first time that the kids had seen content delivered them through devices, and the principal was kind of... Um, shocked as well because I talked to the kids for about two minutes and then the whole 40 minutes remaining was just me circulating around the room um, watching these kids learn through the devices. So, so it was pretty cool and that, that kind of got me thinking about how to um, make more videos and then how to, to make the videos better and, and things like that. So I know you've been to the YouTube page and if you, if you scroll through my videos, um, I think I try to get better each one that I make. So my, my very first video is poor sound quality and uh, <laughs> not my best work, but that, that was one of the videos that I used um, the day of that observation, which was pretty cool. So it's still out there. But um, so yeah, that's, that's how I got started. And um, what else would you like to know about how they're made then? Yeah. I mean, I really like the way you kind of walk through the learning process. And I think all of us who are... Uh, in myself included, we, we try and improve each time, but that's kind of the fun, uh, yeah. it, is getting better each time. And maybe also you could add, besides adding what what programs you use to create mm -hmm. the, the quality, maybe give some tips for that first time user so they don't have to go through all the, the bumps and bruises. Sure. Um, my videos specifically, I start kind of like a movie. Um, I write the script. So I sit on my iPad and Google Docs and I type out the script and I, I try and make it content related or the specific content that I'm trying to get across to the kids and I try and make it um, 
you know, not too complex. Um, you know, one specific science standard, and we just do some details on that. So just like a movie, I start with a script from beginning to end. And then um, I go ahead and I look at each sentence, and I try and think of a way to illustrate it or make the science content come into a, a live or visualize it for the kids. So the app that I used to draw, I've gone through a lot of drawing apps on the iPad. I started with um, Paper. Paper by 53 was a drawing app. I like that one, but I've since moved to, it's called Adobe Ideas, and um, it's really good. It's it's called like a, it's like vector scaling. The drawing, you can zoom in, in pretty much infinitely or, or zoom out, and it just helps with um, coloring in the, the character completely, whereas in um, Paper by 53, I had to, to actually color in the characters. This one now, there's like the paint bucket tool where you can just draw a closed shape and, and make it a solid color. So what I do from there is after I have all the characters drawn um, or whatever I'm trying to illustrate to match my words, I take the pictures and I save them. And how I animate them is, is very simple. I just use Keynote. It's Apple's version of PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. So I put, the, I just make all the videos that you see on YouTube are essentially very elaborate um, keynote presentations. So I, I animate and the, if you watch the videos without the sound you can kind of like think oh yeah this is just a very simple keynote presentation. The characters are just moving in, jumping, flipping and then moving out and that's how I kind of animate uh, like a, a frog coming onto the screen looking the other way and then leaving. So it's, it's very basic but when you kind of add a lot of animations together and then when you um, add your voice over top of it, which is the last thing that I do. Um, you save it as a movie and you put it in YouTube and it, and it kind of comes out uh, like you see on my channel. But like I said about the progression, it's uh, if you look at my first video compared to my most recent one, um, you do try and do better each time. You try and add um, a little bit of music from, I just use the, the copyright free music from um, iTunes and I'm sorry in iMovie and uh, you just add a little jingle add um, links now at the end of my YouTube videos I link them to videos of related content or just back to my channel and um, that's all it is is it, it's just a, a PowerPoint or a keynote that's been saved as a movie with with lots of animations um, with clip arts essentially that I've created so it's kind of cool so if we were to kind of summarize some of the, the key tips is, first, the script is important? I think so. I think that, um, I think the script kind of drives the, the illustrations and the, the visual part to the video. Um, I think what I'm going to try, because what I do now, and it's actually rather complicated, is I record my voice at the same time I'm clicking through on the keynote. And I was watching um, other YouTube channels. There's one ASAP Science, and they made like a little how-to video, and they recommended um, writing the script first, just like I do. But then how they make their videos is they record the um, reading of the script as just one um, clip in an MP3, and then they go through and they add their visuals to the MP3. And I think that'll be, um, I think that might be the way that I switch to do it because I've learned through experience that. To, you're trying to read a script, watch the computer screen, and click to the next um, animation, and it gets it gets rather difficult. It takes me lots of takes to get the final product that I put on YouTube. So yeah, so the first step would be to write the script. I think. How long, um, again, for those trying to do this, how long does it usually take you if you were to give an average of time? Uh, now that you're experienced, and maybe even tell us how long it took you those first. First videos. <laughs> yeah, I've um, through TJ Dunkirk and um, I've had the opportunity to give a number of professional developments on how to make animated videos, and I recommend just start off with a PowerPoint that you already have um, or a keynote, even if it doesn't look like a movie. Get in the habit of um, kind of making it an animated lesson for the kids where. If you just have a, a static PowerPoint with words, um, you can make it into a video. And so I would recommend to the people to just take a work that you already have, practice recording your voice, and then getting the timings to the to the uh, next slide down, and save that as a movie, and see if the kids like it, and then um, kind of move towards less words and and more of a visual, like I have. But as to the amount of time, um, it's. It's a little intensive. I like to do these videos in my free time 
while I'm either watching TV or doing other things. So it, from start to finish, um, it might take me a week's worth of work, working maybe uh, two hours a day at it. So videos could be even a little bit longer than that, depending on how many things you have to draw or how long it takes you to write. For me, the most difficult part is writing the script. Um, I've always been a visual learner, and uh, for me, writing um, writing the script is difficult for me. So once I get past that, it's all fun because then I can draw and put it into the keynote, which is the most fun part for me, and then save it as a movie. So it's a little bit of work, but um, the finished product is worth it. I think you hit on some key points, and I think uh, one of the things that, that struck me in your last comment is is getting kids to create as well. and they may not like that writing piece. That might be the more difficult piece, but when they see the finished product as something really polished and something to be proud of, mm -hmm. the writing kind of falls into place and you want that writing piece to be good. And, and I think your point of, you know, you were a visual learner, I feel the same way. Um, and a lot of our kids, I think, are visual learners. So this type of technology is a real powerful learning piece if we can put it in the hands of students. So maybe yeah, absolutely. Talk about that piece, sorry, and then maybe talk about how your students react to your videos. Sure. Um, yeah, like you said, um, using the having the kids create is obviously the next step. That's where we want all kids to be because I try and think back to myself, um, how do I know so much about this science? It's because, well, I make the videos. I make these projects for the kids. So I'll, that's the next step. If I can get the kids to make videos on their own, then they're going to become the experts. And, and like you said, getting kids to write in any class is difficult. But if you say, I've got this great app, um, Puppet Pals is an example, because it's very simple to use. But I'm not going to let you use this app until you have a, a perfect script that's written. And the longer the script, the longer you can have the iPads, because your videos will be um, you know, more fun. So. I really, I've done that this year in, in past years, and the kids, I find, write more if they know that they're going to do something with that writing. Because oftentimes in, in classrooms, kids write, they might um, exchange papers, peer at it, and things like that, but the work kind of never leaves the classroom. Um, giving kids a way to publish their work, either through a video like Puppet Pals or like the videos that I make, or even on a blog in text form, really helps inspire the kids to, to work just a little bit harder when it is a difficult task, which is writing. So um, the kids react well to the videos. I um, I give my personal videos to my students on iPads. Our classroom has a set of iPads now, and I load them on the iPads because I found that streaming um, 30 videos at the same time just didn't work with our school's network. So. I plug in as many USB cords as I can to my uh, teacher computer and sync um, all the laptops that I can. So the videos are on the, the iPads. So the lesson is kind of simple. It starts off with um, a little introduction. I pass out the iPads, and then I give them the video. Um, I have the kids watch the video through without stopping once. Then I pass out an activity that I want them to do with it. The activities that I have found most successful are um, I I give them the typed script that they're actually seeing and listening to, um, but there's words missing, like the closed notes style would be the uh, technical term for it. So the only task they have to do is listen to the video and then fill in the missing words. Um, at Dunkirk, we have a lot of English language learner students, and we found that that um, is just one of the most successful ways for them to kind of get involved with the with the words and the vocabulary that we're trying to teach them. Listen to it once, and then they're going to watch my video again, pick up on the important terms, and then fill them in in the blanks. Um, and then they've they've already gone through my script essentially twice, um, if not more, if they've had to pause it and rewind. And the more times they go through it, they're picking up on that content. And then um, I'll have some kind of extension activity where they'll have to. Um, you know, write a conclusion or, or do some more um, about the content specifically, whether it be uh, through an app or an online activity or things like that. But the kids really like it. They they respond um, very well to the iPads specifically, and they, and they like the videos. They go home, they leave comments, they share the videos with their friends. Um, their parents come in, and, and they've watched the videos with their parents. And, um, and I know it works, so the kids really like it through positive feedback. So it's pretty good. 
I know you're a pretty young teacher. Have you done the you know traditional way and and this way? And I mean, could you uh, put a you know I hate to to say the D word data, but I mean, do you have data to you know to back up from from the traditional way to this way? Yeah, I, and I think it's so funny you bring that up. It's it's awesome because I um, in preparing for our conversation here, I thought about all the presentations that I've given at you know Digital Waves and and Voces through the years, and um, what I've started doing is um, my topic has always been the same. I've always talked about motivating and engaging through technology, and in my early years, I just showed a lot of the things that I did, but but most specifically in the presentations that I've given, I influence or I, I show data that I've collected because it, it just it's so powerful to include that in your talks because yeah these things are great and as teachers we know they're great but if we can't prove how powerful the iPads are and learning through video is it kind of falls on deaf ears when you ask for support in you know getting new technology in a building and things like that so so I have I've, I've collected data I've I've done control groups where I didn't give them the videos I've um, and mostly my data is um, the assessments at the end of the week. My classroom is very tradi traditional in the way that I give quizzes every single Friday. I don't give big tests. I give little quizzes every Friday, and I use that as my um, way to, to see how the kids are doing on the content. And about three years ago, I did um, a whole semester where one class was not given the videos at all, um, and all of my other four classes were given the videos to learn the science content. and. Uh, for me, the videos are a one-day project, so it's one day is like the iPad day, and then we do different things. We do labs. I still lecture another day of the week, and then maybe they'll do um, writing or reading another day, all to prepare for the quiz on Friday. And the data, I, I, of course, I don't have it with you now, um, clearly shows not only do the kids, when they're when they're polled, which way do they like learning better, with the videos or without the videos, they um, they voted overwhelmingly that. They like using the, the, the iPads and specifically the videos, but then more importantly, student achievement was higher in the classes that learned through video as opposed to the classes that I withheld the iPads from. So I have all that information, and I, I share that now in my more recent um, presentations, but it's it's pretty cool, and I, and I look forward to, in September um, collecting some more data about um, student outcomes with using different um, sources of uh engagement other than video so you know I'm gonna ask you a kind of an off off script question here sure. um, what you said and I believe exactly what you're saying I believe the data is long-term gonna show that that this is the way our students need to learn do you feel that other teachers are embracing this um, do they have to embrace it um, and I guess long-term is you know, I feel we need to make these kind of changes in school. Do you think it's happening? And if it is, how can we keep it, keep that momentum forward? And if you feel it isn't, or it's at least lagging behind, how do we get, you know, our fellow teachers to buy in and push the envelope? It's a tough question, and I've been asked this before, and my answer has, oh, it seems to be changing. In the past, I've seen great. I've worked with great teachers who who don't use technology at all, and the kids um, achieve, and they have great outcomes, and they're engaged in the lessons. And in a way, I don't think teachers need to change if if they already have something in the classroom that's working. But I think teachers need to, to take a look at themselves and say, "Are my kids achieving the outcomes necessary?" And if they are, then that's great. Keep doing what you're doing. But if they're not, then you have to change what you're doing in the classroom. And I think more often than not, there's a lot of kids um, in today's classroom that aren't engaged. They aren't achieving as well as they could be. So a teacher has to realize, wow, if I have a student who's not achieving in my classroom, I have to change what I'm doing in the classroom to help them um, advance in the curriculum. So does it have to be technology? Um, Every part of me wants to say yes, but I still am in close contact. I see teachers that don't need technology to be um, stellar teachers, but I think that the student is changing. Um, I think that I, I'm going to my 10th year of teaching now, and I've seen that the students that I had 
in my first, you know, even five years of teaching are very different than the students I have today and the students I'll have five years from now. So I'm, I'm a huge technology guy. So I think my answer has changed completely now to the point where I think you're going to have to start using technology. Um, and I think schools are just going to have to start going more towards one-to-one. -to -one. I see schools um, initially made large investments in um, interactive whiteboards and things like that. And at first, um, those may have been appealing, but I think uh, an interactive whiteboard only engages one student or maybe two at a time, where you have 25 to 27 kids remaining just watching what's going on. But if we start putting devices in every student's hand, then as a teacher, I can ask a question to the class and I don't have to wait for a student to raise their hand. I can tell them to respond. So instead of maybe three out of my 30 students raising their hand every time I ask a question, I can get all 30 kids in the classroom to respond to my question through a device. And I think that's very powerful learning. So I think schools are going to have to move towards one-to-one um, -to -one devices. I, I prefer the iPad for a number of reasons, but um, I think um, any device is a good start. And how how do we make that change? I mean, is it is it really just um, I guess talking the talk and walking the walk? Yeah, it's others on board. I think it's outcome based. I think you have to if you're if we're, if I'm requesting um, one to one devices, I think you got to show the data. You got to say, hey, this is my classroom and I run one to one, and these are the outcomes of my students. Now here's another classroom. And they don't run one to one. Um, let's look at their outcomes. So I think we gotta, yeah, we gotta put it to the test now. And if, if these are really gonna make a change in the learning process, we gotta prove it with um, data. And it's there. Great. All right, I'll go back on script here for a sec. Thanks for sure. putting up for the off script question. Um, I guess you've answered a lot of these. What are some of the technologies yeah. that you're working with now? And we'll just combine that with our next question. What are some future trends that you personally are looking to explore? All right. Well, yeah. Um, I think some of the things that I'm working with now, I, I really, I've been, this summer I've been to a lot of um, Spencer Kagan trainings and things like that. And one of his big teachings is, oh, why ask one kid when I can ask a question to all of them? And he's the big cooperative learning guru. Um, and I just like cooperative learning um, infused with technology. So the two things that I use most in my classroom are Nearpod and um, Socrative. It, they're both ways that I can ask one question to the class and get everybody to respond at the same time. Um, and they're both seamless with um, any device that you have, whether it be a Windows 8 tablet or an iPad. So th those, are, those are current trends in education is just I think we got to move away from a teacher asking a class a question and then just being happy when one kid answers. You got to get everybody to answer. And then you got to use that information that you're collecting from their answers to adjust your pacing, reteach, or move on if everybody knows it. So I think those are two powerful tools that I use and I'm going to continue to use. Um, and in the future, the, one of the things that I just kind of stumbled upon this summer was um, EDU Canon. Are you familiar with that one or no? No. It's, it's, it's pretty cool and I, I want to do it with my kids this um, year but all that it is is you take a video off of YouTube or TeacherTube and you can embed um, interactive questions or responses right into the video. So I, I made a sample one with my uh, five facts about density video so the kids will log on to EDU Canon. It's just a, a short link that you give them. Mm -hmm. And the video starts to play and then at a designated spot in the video, the video will pause and um, a multiple choice question will pop up and the kids will have to answer the question and then it will give them immediate feedback. Or a short answer response will come up where they'll have to type something out and the responses are um, collected onto the teacher login and you can see how the kids are doing in real time watching the videos. So I think that's it's it's pretty cool. I haven't done it with students yet, but I did it at a workshop this summer at Dunkirk and it's it worked seamlessly. So it's pretty cool. EDU Canon was that. So that's what I want to do in my classroom this year. And then I just want to collect um, a lot of data on everything. I want to do um, you know, more scientific um, research studies to see if technology is effective. And um, one of the things that I 
just kind of agreed upon today was to do like um, more like teacher point of view videos with a GoPro camera attached to my head or something like that <laughs> to, to view. To, I want to see, I want to show other teachers what I see and I want to stick it to a kid, see what the kids are seeing and um, kind of like a football team reviews video of a game. I kind of want to review a video of my own lessons for personal growth and see what the kids are seeing and things like that. So, so I think that's the future. Yeah, that sounds really awesome. Um, that Ed Buchanan, I haven't heard of that, but I have heard of Ed Puzzle. Okay. Just, that's a very similar from what your description is. Sure. Those are two tools you could probably um, use. And I like that idea of using, you know, infusing questions within a video. And yeah, I think, I think that's pretty cool too. Lots of research that says, you know, the longer you wait after showing a video to ask a question is the longer, you know, mm -hmm. it, it's it's not as uh, conducive to learning. So the quicker yeah, you can that's ask how it that starts. question. Like, yeah, because that's how it starts. If they answer it immediately, then it starts building in their memory. You know what I mean? And mm -hmm. then the more it's in the memory, they, then that's learning. So it's kind of cool. But, yeah. Cool. I'm going to have to check that out. Um, yeah. All right. So what or who or what inspires you as a professional? Um, I guess I'm – I just don't – I don't want to give a boring lesson. So, I, you know, <laughs> so I try and – the re I, tr I work very hard to engage all of my students and make sure that everyone has a fun time in science class. So uh, my inspiration is probably the students and the fact that I don't want to. I don't want these kids having their heads down in science class. I really want kids to come in um, and have a good time, and I want them to like science class. And I don't want any behavior issues. And what I found out is when kids are wholeheartedly engaged in a lesson, then they're not misbehaving. So. I guess it's kind of selfish in the way I, that I don't want the kids screwing around. I don't want to, you know, discipline kids. So I, I work very hard to make an engaging lesson so kids are on task and um, enjoying class. So that's kind of my inspiration there. But great, you mentioned. Um, can you mention again who you were talking about with the collaborative learning? Uh, Spencer yeah, Kagan. Okay. Yeah, I, yeah. We uh, Spencer Kagan works a lot with cooperative learning and things like that. So I've attended a bunch of his workshops. Um, this summer, and I'm actually participating in one right now, so it's kind of cool. <laughs> Great. Um, tell us about uh, you've done presentations in the past. I know uh, Digital Wave and and other places. Have you been to NiceGate, the big NiceGate conference? I have been there, but I haven't presented it there that okay. one. So um, yeah, so I I started off at Digital Wave. Uh, I think I've been there. I think I've been there like seven times now, so it's kind of cool, <laughs> you know, and I've saved all my presentations, so, um, but it's always the same theme, like I said, motivate, engage with technology, and um, I love presenting at them because I meet a lot of people, and um, now with social media, and specifically Twitter, I can keep in contact with those people, and um, upcoming, I'll be at SUNY Fredonia, well, they're just called Fredonia now, October 4th, they're opening the new science building here, and I'll be talking to science teachers about um, instructional technology, and then in November in Albany, there's a TESOL conference that I was just asked to speak at about um, instructional technology with um, ESL students. So those, those are two things that I have coming up, and uh, I look forward to doing both of those. Great. You're going to be keeping busy. That's good. Yeah, that's cool. Um, and just kind of following up off of that, it seems like you're really, um, you know, you're inspiring me just, just talking here. <laughs> are you looking to go, where are you looking to go, say, 10 years from now? Are you still thinking you're going to be in the classroom? Are you looking to go maybe admin? Um, are you looking to go college? Is there some thought as to? Uh, yeah, I think on the time. <laughs> difficult. Um, I think part of what helps me be relevant as um, a technology integrator is that I is that I work with students because oftentimes I'll sit at a at a technology conference and I'll see things and I'll say, oh, you know, that wouldn't work in the classroom, and people might know that, you know. But um, I think that as I as I'm going into my tenth year now, I think that um, I see myself helping more students in a role as like an instructional technology coach. I think that this is a position that um, more and more districts are going to be um, implementing or creating. And I, how I view that position is it would be a person like me who has a technology 
um, interest centralized or located in a building where I could work with um, teachers very closely and then in classrooms as well helping teachers to use instructional technology to motivate and engage and then increase achievement. So I, I would like to do something like that. Um, I, I have attended Fredonia to earn my um, school building leader certificate. I'm not completed with that yet but I have started that and um, I just don't want to leave any you know <laughs> Paths. So I'm open, but um, right. as a, I'd be happy teaching in Dunkirk the rest of my life. But um, we'll see. I'll, I think I'll end up wherever I'm most needed. You know, so <laughs> who knows? <laughs> yeah, I kind of call it riding the wave. You know, that's that's kind of the way I've gone with my career. If an if an opportunity opens up, you just you you go with it. You know. Exactly. Exactly. All right. Are you ready for the speed geek questions? Yeah, I'm done. Right. I'm ready for whatever you got. <laughs> okay. All right, this is, um, I use this little app, I know you can't really see it, I should get a better app, but it's called Decide Now. And oh, you can, cool, yeah. You can set up a bunch of different questions or, you know, just if you want to, you know, where you want to go for dinner tonight, you can click it sure. and decide now. So I put a bunch of questions in here for our speed geeks, so I'll just spin them and go. I wish I could see them on, online, but here we go, you get, you get three of them. Okay. So our first one is, favorite comic book hero? Oh man, I don't know about this one. I don't read a whole lot of comic books, but um, I'll tell you, I, I I'm engaged, and um, all of my fiancés, nieces, and nephews are real into um, Batman. Believe it or not, so I got to go with the kids on this one. So okay. I'll say Batman. Well, congratulations. That's a good one. Yep. Nothing wrong with Batman. All right. Second one is iOS or Android. Um, I iOS. I'm a big iOS fan. Yeah. Looking forward to the newest one coming out here. You're a, and I take it you're a Mac fan pretty much through and through? Pretty uh pretty much. But you gotta be flexible. I mean my school computer is you know, PC, but at home I have both, so Where you gotta does be Google, ready for whatever, you know. Does Google fit in there anywhere? Google Chromebooks or anything? Yeah, I yeah, I mean I use Google Chrome as my exclusive browser, but um I don't have a Chromebook or anything like that yet. But um our school has Windows eight tablets, but I would prefer they get more iPads, but uh, <laughs> okay. it's all right. <laughs> all right, and last one. Let's see if we can get a unique one. Oh, I got the iOS Android one again. Let me try it one more time. I don't know if you can see it on here. It's a pretty fun. Oh, app. it's okay. Yeah, I see it. That's cool. Yeah. Uh, your favorite social network? Um, it's well. I have to say, I just recently created a. Facebook page for my classroom this school year, and the kids loved it. Um, I use Twitter as a professional, but um, to, to just get into the lives of my students, I created a page that the kids can then like, and um, and I like that for um, what I how I use it is I post notes and um, videos, and I post once a day for my students. It's kind of like a mini review, so I think that one's good for the kids, but as a professional, I use Twitter. All right. Well, Google Classroom's coming, so yeah. Oh, yeah. Really? I know. I want to learn more about that. So <laughs> it's coming. It'll be there. Yeah. Cool. Hey, this has been great. All right. Well, Mark, thank you for your time and thank you for yep. your thoughts. Uh, like I said, you, you're really inspiring in all the stuff you're doing. So keep up the good work, and um, I can't wait to see you at the Technology Integrators Forum coming up this oh, yeah. October. So. And yeah. we'll see you at uh, hopefully the Digital Wave and all that good yep. stuff too. So and, uh, we'll see you Great. on the block. We'll see you at Subway. Thanks for having so. me. I appreciate it. <laughs> see you later. All Bye. right, Mark. Bye.